Welcome back, everybody. I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with a member of my Chicago acting community, a writer, an actress, a voiceover specialist, and somebody who's a fascinating person that I can't wait to ask a lot of questions of, uh, Ruth Hoffman. Hi, Ruth. Hey, Alan. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. Again, I uh, you know I saw you uh, for the first time I think at Blue Door where we had uh, where we had one of the workshops. Uh, by the way, it's no longer Blue it Door. Was, um, it's the it's Ford. the Forge, and we were in a Matthew Berry class, I think. Yes, and I uh, uh, actually I was talking to Matt uh, about uh, jumping on the show. We're trying to find the time that he can do ah. it, but he should be on. Um, speaking of the people who are on, and we'll we'll get uh, we'll get to uh, to our story in a second, but. You know, I'm, I was looking at um, the uh, the movies that you're uh, working on, and the one that's in post prod, and the one that's in post prod. Uh, you know, the person that I had on very recently, another member of our Chicago community, Mickey uh, uh, O'Sullivan. He was on. He's in yes. that. Uh, another person who was supposed to be on, and then her schedule got uh, stopped with uh, ADR, who will be on shortly in July, is uh, Robin Coffin. Who is another member of our Chicago community? So you're in films in the same Chicago community, and these are the folks that are being kind enough to come onto the show as well. <laughs> yes, it, it's it's a big community, but can also be small. So yeah, um, I love our Chicago community. It's I, I have not found, uh, and again, I, it's I'm starting out. I've only do, been doing this for you know, let's say three years or so. Uh, but I have not found any jerks. I have not found any people who are only, no, this is mine. I'm not going to share anything. Uh, I've found everybody to be just very open. It's a very, it's a very uh, friendly, friendly, friendly yeah. community. Yeah. Yeah. So you found that as well. Uh, you've been doing this uh, for yes. quite a bit longer. Yeah. Chicago is awesome. So uh, <clears throat> people, if, uh, if you're thinking of starting acting and you're in Chicago, join <laughs> our community. It's a really, really nice place. Um, okay. So, you know, among the things that I was fascinated to, uh, to learn about you is how much we actually have in common. Um, you are an actor. You're a writer. Um, you knew that you wanted to be an actor since you were, you know, a little girl. Um, yes, which I, saying that out loud sounds like I was a little girl. I wanted to be an actor, but <laughs> it's the age that I'm referring to. Um, and uh, you kind of went away from it. And uh, you even went to law school. Uh, I was pre-law. Um, you, you know, meant uh, to write and uh, I meant to write. You have uh, books, you know, I have books. You know, we're gonna talk about all of these things. Um, I found a lot of similarities and the energy of the person who knows what their true calling is, but because of their family and because of uh, obligations and other things didn't allow you know yourself uh, to do that until uh, you said enough is enough. I have to do it. Uh, well, well, I did it on the side my entire life. I just didn't pursue it full time. But I always, um, even when I had a real job, I was taking yeah. acting classes, doing things like working as an extra, taking improv classes. Um, for a lot of that time, I still did have an agent, so I was doing a few things, but. As you well know, the scheduling of acting is so crazy. And yep. it was that that sort of propelled me to quit the real job because uh, you don't want to be turning down auditions. No. Um, and I remember myself kind of being put in that uh, in that grinder as well and having to make difficult decisions because, you know, I have a you know fairly high paying uh, uh, consulting IT consulting job and once I started auditioning, once I started getting to the point where, you know, you're getting to the next level auditions, I started getting Empire auditions and PD auditions, uh, which are downtown Chicago. I live all the way in the northern suburbs. So I had to start rearranging schedules and sure. you know, getting, I, I got uh, re, re just, um, uh, you know, shared office space so I can work from downtown and then, you know, make my lunch based on when the audition is. So it's a real uh, hustle, and I wanted to It is to a learn... hustle, and it's... Go ahead. No, I just wanted to learn about your experience and kind of how, yeah. how you make things work. Well, like I said, I had a real job, in yeah. part because my dad just didn't believe that I could make any kind of living at all as an actor. 
And I succumbed to that pressure for a long time. And I did go to law school. I graduated, passed the bar. And for 16 years, I worked in sales, marketing, and training, also at a fairly high level. And I was doing well at it. I won uh, national top performer awards at two different companies. So I had four weeks paid vacation um, and other benefits like health insurance. And those can be really gold handcuffs that are hard to walk away from. But for me anyway, as I got older, I looked around at a certain age, you can do the math yourself, and figured that my life was more than half over, and there's no guarantee that you could be healthy enough in retirement to have the physical energy to do some of the things that we need to do. It's not like I do action scenes or anything like that, but you know, being on set all day can be draining, mm-hmm. or you might have to stand for a long time, or, or who knows, you know, I, I once did a commercial where I was standing most of a 12 hour day in shoes that weren't even my own. So, and I was excited to do the commercial, don't get me, you know, but it, it, it's not like you're being catered to hand and foot and people are feeding you grapes or anything. So I had to decide the time had come where someday had to be now. Mm-hmm. And so I quit the job and, yeah. but I already had an agent, so I don't recommend people just sort of waking up one day being, hmm, I think I'm going to be an actor and then leaving a job with no, you know, I already had headshots. I already had, uh, like I said, an agent. Uh, I One of the first things I did do was take voiceover classes and get a voiceover demo so that I could move more into that market. And because I already had an on-camera agent, perhaps they took me right away. So, so part of it is deciding what areas do you want to be in what background do you have? And like I said, I'd been taking classes for years. I'd already completed Second City, what was Improv Olympic, a couple at the Annoyance and comedy sports. I'd done all that. So I had, and I had a few bookings to my name, some small things, but I did have a commercial and things like that. And so I finally just said, I have to commit to this so I can be available and not turn down auditions. Yeah, it's it's a tough uh, tough thing <clears throat> to uh, to do. I'm happy you did it. You said that you know at some point it was uh, close to happening. <laughs> so it seems like it was just a few years ago then. Um, nope, that was 2000, uh, the end of 2005. But you know how holidays can be. So I really began, I would say, in 2006. So 14 okay. years. I got you. 14, um, 15, yeah. A lot of things to dive into. So let's uh, let's kind of back up a little bit. Um, I, I also come from, uh, from parents who said, no, no, you have to get a real job. Uh, acting is not something that, uh, that pays the bills. Uh, my dad came at it because, you know, he, uh, grew up and he was very, uh, active in theater. His best friend became a full-time actor and he saw the best friend struggle. And, you know, us coming to the United States, my parents wanted me to have, you know, a normal life. So those were kind of the driving forces behind what he was uh, saying, and he's very supportive now, but that's why he didn't want me to have a a career. What was uh, was the Mm -hmm. issue that uh, your parents had? The same sort of thing. My dad believed that there were only three acceptable jobs that people could have. Doctor. One was the, go ahead, doctor, lawyer, and what's the third? Uh, I'm I'm thinking maybe teacher? Own your own business. Okay, got it. He might have accepted, I don't know, architect or engineer or something like that. But um, And my sister got an MBA and did own her own business. And my brother is a doctor. So he got it all. So technically, <laughs> they, they took the pressure off of you, right? You know, your parents already had that. You could do anything else, right? Well, no, I'm the oldest. So I was the lawyer first. Yeah, yeah. But even when I was an adult and had this real job, um, For my dad, he still didn't understand why I was doing acting and things on the side. So every time I bring up that I was an extra in this movie or I did this or that, he'd say, literally, what are you still doing that for? So it's sad to me when a parent can't even accept your passion as a a major hobby or avocation. But Um, has that changed at any point? Uh, Has your family died? He's dead. (laughs) So <laughs> right. did he uh, at any point uh, accept uh, what you were doing? No, not that I'm aware of. If he did inside, he never shared it. So, um, yeah. But I'm, yeah, yeah, 
I, I just wish, you know, it's hard to know as a kid, especially when you're in college, um, and especially when we grew up before the internet. Yeah. I think that's really opened up the knowledge that people could have. You know, back in our day, if you wanted to say, could I be an actor, right? You'd have to go to a library, hope somebody had written a book on that topic, look it up in the credit card and hope it was current enough. You know, there's still a lot of great books in libraries. I love libraries. But to get sort of the cutting edge information on careers or how to do a career or anything, I think was a lot more challenging in our generation. Now you can Google or search for almost anything and have, yes, there's misinformation out there, but you can have sort of a basis for moving forward in a few minutes. And I think, I don't know how your life or my life would have been different if we had that tool at our fingertips. And YouTube videos too, you know, none of that existed, so. It's true, yeah, there's there's a lot of information out there. Um, yeah. You're right, There there is a lot of misinformation. There are people who wanna take advantage of you. I have, you know, because of my, you know, uh, background, I'm uh, from the former Soviet Union. Um, a lot of the parents who are now kind of uh, my age and their kids, want to go into acting, you know, they contact me and they ask uh, questions and uh, I save them, you know, thousands of dollars because there are, uh, you know, sharks out there that are just trying to milk them for things that are not real. So it's well, there's the same for voiceover demos, too. You, you, you just have to be careful choosing providers for things, for sure. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. There's a lot more information and uh, it's it's readily available if you want to actually make that your calling. Um, diving again uh, back into uh, into your background, you mentioned that <clears throat> you finished law school, uh, you got your uh, you uh, you passed the bar, and you spent your career in sales. Um, was it tied to a uh, law, or uh, you decided not to practice law in London sales? I, I, I first had a job for a few years selling mm -hmm. uh, radio ratings to advertising agencies. Yeah. So it was more in, in radio and advertising. And then mm -hmm. for 13 years, I worked in a job that you had to have a law degree to have. So I nice. got it. So yeah. it just it ended up being kind of a mixture of, uh, of law and sales uh, work. OK, that yes. makes sense. Um, I spend a lot of time on sales as well. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. I've uh, ran my businesses and I think most of the uh, jobs that I had uh, even before that involved sales. So uh now you know going into acting and you've experienced and i think you actually are teaching classes on it now uh, but how sales is similar to acting and how a lot of the things that we've learned in that background are, is helping us you know anytime you make a cold call i remember uh making cold calls for a consulting service you make a cold call uh you're going to get you know 90 percent of people or 99 percent of people who are hanging up on you some of which are swearing at you in acting, it's a little different, but we're so used to rejection. You know, sales, acting, it's in a lot of ways, it's similar. Sales, acting, writing, there's a lot of ways to be rejected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that, you know, we uh, actors in general are people who want to be out there. We're very expressive. We want to be appreciated. We want to be loved. And yet we're in a profession that all, all that we're experiencing most of the time is rejection. Yes. Well, as many people say, and I'm sure you've heard this, our job is auditioning and bookings are sort of the icing on the cake. So, yeah, um, I, I heard that. And it uh, the first time I heard it was a number of years ago and it didn't click until I started doing it. And then you get <laughs> that mode of like, yep, that makes sense. Um, and it's much, much easier that way. All right. So um, I want to talk about your extra work because you've mentioned that as uh, you had your yeah. uh, full time, yeah. uh, full -time job. Um, the way for you to continue working uh, and doing uh, your kind of uh, passion was to do extra work, was to take uh, classes. So you've, I think you've been extra on 70 uh, movies uh, or, or At least something. 70. Yeah. yeah. Um, At least 70. I, I have a list and I could double check, but I, I think it's closer to 80. But yeah, I, because I could use one vacation day usually for my real job to do that. So um, in Chicago, so again, I did a lot. Right now in Chicago, there's a lot more uh, a lot more things being shot. Well, not right now as right. in uh, currently in COVID times, but you know, in general, <laughs> in the space, uh, there's a lot of stuff being done. Uh, when you started out, uh, in terms of um, you know the type of uh, extra work, what was available? Yeah. Because I'm not sure what well, was. Well, I did 
a lot of feature films. My first one, I didn't know extras could get paid. So my first one was Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh. I'm in the parade, but you can't see me. And this is when I started to decide I had to learn more about acting because this is literally what it was. The paid extras line stopped here. Okay. And then there was me. So the person standing right next to me, and it's true that extras don't get paid a lot, but the fact that I was doing the same thing for completely free and the person right next to me was getting paid, was like, I gotta investigate this again yeah. before the internet. Uh, so then I, of course, didn't work for free, except maybe on occasion for a friend. But yeah, yeah. so I did a lot of it because it was something I could fit into my schedule at the time. and they were always looking for people. So I did a lot of feature films. I also was an extra in Florida for, for a Burt Reynolds thing. And mm -hmm. I actually once in Lithuania. So. Oh, that's, that's amazing. And as an extra, I, that's, that's kind of cool. As a featured uh -huh. extra, yeah. I'm a super Highlander fan, Highlander the TV show. And mm -hmm. through that, I got to go to Lithuania and be a featured extra on Highlander 5, The Source. Very cool. Well, there can be only one. Cool. There can, can be only one. Yeah. Um, I have a picture somewhere, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it was super fun. Um, Cold, but super fun. Let's let's talk about uh, featured extras because you know, as um, again, starting out uh, in acting on yeah. more of a full time basis about three years ago for me, um, what I heard all the time is don't do extra work because if you're doing extra work, then you cannot be uh in that uh world for at least sure. a couple of years so i stayed away from it uh i understand well, why but that's why feature films were a good idea because right. at my at my level especially back then the chance of me getting an audition for a major motion picture you right. know like one of the batman films or i'm trying to think or like public enemies even you know at, at that time i probably you know not not gonna happen so I didn't see that that was an issue for the Chicago TV shows that sort of sit down here is a whole different story. Um, so featured extras, uh, you got mm -hmm. a chance, was it the speaking or it was just the being? Well, the extras don't speak. Right. Once you speak, you're technically a principal. Okay. So extras don't speak, but featured in my understanding and the things I've done, means that you're not sort of sitting at a table in a restaurant over there. You're either right with the principal or the shot is just of you and maybe a couple other people. I'm sure different people have definitions, but that's my understanding of it. Now, I would never put that on my resume. Right. Even back then, I wouldn't do it. Um, I, I, maybe it's a little bit different now, but back when I used to be an extra, it, uh, I know that many casting directors and agents don't value that. I think it is a good education for beginning actors to see how different stars are on set, how set etiquette works, all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. I just kept doing it because I wanted to hit 50. Yeah, well, you certainly did. That's very cool. So, um, And then did... I wrote a novel about it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then uh, the follow-up is, uh, is, is it available already or it's, it's about to be out? Yep. No, they're both on Amazon. This is the, uh, so I have, I wrote, my life is an extra, some of which may be true, only my hairdresser knows for sure. And then I wrote, my life is a star, uh, which is mostly more fiction because I'm not, I would not say I'm a star yet. So, but there, there are two novels I wrote because I felt I had some knowledge of the industry that I thought would make interesting books yeah oh it's 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 great we're we're definitely going to uh post them uh, below the video so oh, people uh, please thank uh, check you. them out thank you um, oh thank you what what did you learn uh, as an extra what uh, are some of the acting <sighs> ways that now you're utilizing as uh as a not quite star but a real working mm -hmm. actor well but i still would say in my experience for most things principals and extras are treated differently so it doesn't really translate as much in my experience um a lot of times when you're an extra most of the time they never know your name i did some stand-in work too and at least when you're a stand-in they know your name and in my opinion and experience you're treated more like a principal than when you're an extra um okay. i've had some very bad conditions as an extra once for a cbs show there was not even toilet paper or chairs and 
they don't care. So okay. at least in my experience, you know, I don't mean to speak for the global community. Mm -hmm. So, um, so often extra work, I would honestly, most of the time I would call it grunt work. Mm -hmm. um, you're paid less, even if you're on set for the same amount of time. Um, one of the things, it's, it's just a different thing. I'd rather talk about my principal <laughs> roles, but um, a lot of actors, I still do recommend. It's a good way to learn about the community. Yeah, uh, I did it once uh, by uh, by kind of not paying enough attention. I submitted for a role, and then I got something, and then I realized that after it reading that it was a extra. It was for a uh, ComEd uh, commercial, and um, it was it was a great experience because I got to see what a you know a big commercial set looks like and how many takes the principals have to go through and exactly. how many times and how you know what the director uh, you know says and how they uh, ask them and how do they try to take and it's that you know 30 second spot takes hours and hours uh, to shoot so it was a great educational experience for me but that's the only extra work that yeah. I've done and and how much downtime there is on set and it's different to watch other people try to take direction than take it yourself so I think that's a lesson that that uh, starting off actors can learn is really watch what to, if you're close enough to hear, sometimes you are and sometimes you're not, but if you're close enough to hear a director give the principals some direction, watch how they, if they change or not. Another okay. thing I did, um, I interned at a casting agency okay. and I would recommend that if people can, can share the time because when you're in the room and you see actors you know come in and how they do or don't take direction, it, in, it's a very interesting experience. Yeah, um, let's uh, let's jump on to principal work and let's talk about that. Thanks. <laughs> um, there are many acting approaches, and uh, you know, as actors, we all try to figure out what works for us, and uh, you know, uh, taking that and running with it and thinking that that's the answer. Uh, what is your approach? What have you found that works for you? I've taken a variety of acting classes, but I would not say that I follow any specific. Mm -hmm. approach like Meisner or, you know, I, you know, I would not say I'm a devotee of any. I try to go with the approach of being really in the moment and listening and reacting to the to the scene. Gotcha. Um, That's what I try to do. Yeah. And if, uh, you know, I like to put things in buckets, it's my analytical uh, IT hat. But um, <laughs> I, I basically think that in terms of acting approaches, there is just be yourself be completely somebody else or being somewhere in the middle? Where would you put yourself? Well, mostly what I get cast in is some aspect, I think, of myself. Mm -hmm. I either haven't had opportunities or haven't chosen, I guess it's a mix, to audition for a character that to me required excessive transformation mm -hmm. of myself. Um, so, I think it's just, it's partly branding or just partly how you're seen, what hmm. opportunities come to you. So um, I'm fine with that. There's plenty, you know, I, I'd like to think I have different aspects I can bring to life on camera. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I get you. Yeah, it's, um, and um, I had a casting director on uh, just uh, earlier this week, uh, I think on Monday, uh, Kathy Rankin, who, uh, who did Frasier. And uh, her basic approach is, listen, it's it's all you. It's just you uh, in commercials. Yep. In TV, it's just you. Yep. And TV, <clears throat> yeah. Particularly, you know, very specific yep. stop work. It's not you. It's just you. So uh, it makes sense. <laughs> and um, I've been told, you, mm -hmm. you know, one thing about acting is it's not always, especially at our levels, in my opinion, it's not about what you want. It, right. It's about what they want you to do. So how do casting directors perceive you? How do your materials make you come across? If you have any clips, what do they say about what you can do? So mm -hmm. I think it's a lot of that. And I'm great, you know, I'm always happy for any opportunities. I, I have been able to do a lot of comedy, which I enjoy. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes it builds on itself because if you book something that's comedy and then you have a clip from that and then other people see that clip, they think, oh, maybe she can do this. So. Mm -hmm. I think that can really be helpful too. 
I think so. It, uh, and again, as, as starting out, it's hard to put the right things on tape. <clears throat> I get to uh, yeah. ask, you know, I get asked to do a lot of drama, which I enjoy. And uh, it's interesting, but I'm goofy. Uh, I'm, I'm wacky. I'm, I'm a weirdo. I love comedy. Mm. <laughs> Just I don't get to yeah. do a lot of comedy, or at least not yet. So I want that aspect to come well, on. So yeah, maybe your time will come. It is hard, as you know, to get footage of things you've done. I know some people say it's okay to have a scene written for you or write a scene that you choose to do. Um, and maybe that does work for some people. I hope it does. But I just try to use clips from things I've been cast in because I think that shows sort of another level of, you know, somebody wanted you to audition for this. Somebody probably gave you a callback for this. Somebody booked you for this. You did the job. The project came out as opposed to, I'm going to do this for myself. Now, creating content is great, and, and a lot of people do well with it. But I guess I just like the sort of the vetting process of having something from an actual project, no, it, if it, possible. It, it, yeah. Uh, well, listen, if, any, if anybody is watching and they're watching this YouTube uh, channel, they get to see the real me. So then they'll see the different aspects of it. There you go. Um, okay, I, I want to talk about uh, improv and um, how much improv you're utilizing because you're doing all sorts of things. You're doing commercials, you're doing voiceover work, you're doing uh, you know short films, you're doing features. Uh, I want to uh, you know come back to improv because you did finish Second City, I did as well. Uh, you've done uh, IO and uh, comedy sports, right? I think you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what aspects of improv are you using uh, more often than not? Well, I get asked to improv a lot, which is great. Yeah. And I'm grateful that I've had the experience of being on teams and I've done a lot of corporate improv too to, yeah. to help bring that to in, into experience. On commercials, improv is often recommended and a lot of times I'll see in the spec, sometimes even in capital letters, improv experience a must. So just having that training and experience can sometimes get you in the door. On feature films, I've been asked to improvise and that's fun and it's also scary because there's a whole crew of people not mm -hmm. knowing what you're gonna say or do and another actor that then has to respond to something they don't think is coming. You know, one thing that's nice about acting as opposed to real life is you're given things to say. And you know what the other person's going to say. Yep. But when you improv, it can put a lot of pressure on you to be clever in the moment while there's 30, 40, 50, however many people waiting on you. And yeah. the other thing, when you do improv in the real world, maybe not now because of the virtual thing, but when I used to do improv, if something was funny to the audience at the time, they would laugh. And then that could sort of give you fodder to continue that vain or if they don't laugh for a while to try to go in a different direction but when you're improvising on a film it's dead silent so you don't know if what you did was entertaining or felt flat until after the shot is way over and then maybe someone will come up and say that was really funny so yeah. that's the pressure i love doing it and i'm grateful when something i improvise makes it to the final film but it is it does put a little bit of pressure i think yeah, um, it does, and it, it all depends on who you're working with, right? Because improv is about more than one person. Uh, so if you have somebody who's comfortable in that environment, then you can just riff and have fun, and uh, hopefully something good comes out of it. Um, right, but you're wasting, well, I don't want to call it wasting, you're using the entire use. crew's time yes. or maybe a take if it yeah. doesn't go well. And that's, yeah. you know, in live improv, there's a lot more going on, if you will, you know, so I mean, I'm grateful and I love it and I, I, I do want to do more of it, but I just feel I still feel the tension, even though I've done it a bunch of times. I get you. In uh, my own self. <laughs> um, do you watch uh, Middle, uh, Middle Stitch, uh, Middle Ditch, I think, in, and Schwartz uh, on Netflix? It's a long form uh, improv. It's uh, oh, I'll know, look it up. Two, uh, two very talented guys, you know, uh, the main character from Silicon Valley is uh, Middle Ditch and uh, Schwartz, uh, Ben Schwartz is in a whole bunch of stuff, uh, including I think Parks and Rec. Oh, I know who he is, yeah. yeah. So uh, they just, you know, they just riff and they riff the whole hour and they do long form. I've never done long form improv, but it looks amazingly fun. I want to try it. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's challenging also, but it's I, it's fun. 
yeah, so I yeah, so I so to sum that up, I had to do it in feature films, in uh, commercials, not as much in dramatic roles, but mostly in comedic roles. So, you got to well, very cool. Um, let's uh, let's uh, kind of have a reality check, right? Because you're uh -huh. a work. Uh, no, it's everybody goes through a reality check. You know, Michael Cost uh, okay. uh, gave me a reality check and answered that question, which I appreciate it. Okay. Um, I it's it's very important for uh, for our community to understand what the reality is. And uh, you know, you you're a working actor, um, and you're doing voiceover, you're doing commercials, you're doing a lot of uh, you know corporate stuff, you're doing you know features and shorts and everything else. Uh, from acting only, and we'll get to your writing in just a second, but from acting only, you know, how, uh, how is it in terms of, you know, making a living that you're comfortable with uh, being an actor in Chicago doing all of these things? Does it work? 90%. 90%. Uh, okay. So it's it's good if uh, again you're doing all of these things, but I think is it ninety percent because you're doing all of these things as opposed to relying on one particular one? I think so. Okay. I think that is it. I think especially now diversifying can be helpful if you have the skills to do so because voiceover work has continued to come in where some on camera work has been put to the side because of what's been going on in the world. So, but there's livings and there's living. Of course. You know, am I earning as much as when I had my real job? Absolutely not. But mm -hmm. it's a choice, maybe someday. Um, mm -hmm. But I really wanted to pursue, yeah, thank you. I really wanted to pursue, like you do, these creative careers and mm -hmm. see what would happen. And so I've been doing it for since 2006. So we'll just keep hope, you know, but, but when you're an entrepreneur or a freelancer, especially yeah. in times of crisis like this, Every month sort of is like, mm, you know, will I cover my costs? So, yeah, um, my way again, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily recommending it for anybody. But if you're watching and thinking of another, you know, but potential approach is because I have a consulting company, I kind of, um, you know, I declined a number of things and I restructured my time where I work from home. And uh, based on the rates that I am able to charge in a niche that I found uh, that I had to find and get uh, to be an expert in, based on the rates that allows me, if things work properly, that allows me to work not a full you know, 40 hour per week schedule, which then allows me to do this show and allows me to audition and allows me to have the flexibility of which projects I can take. So that's what I'm building. Um, it's not working quite yet, especially you know with uh, with COVID, a lot of things uh, kind of fell uh, fell apart. But that's my approach. Uh, that's great. That's so. that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, I hoped I had been doing some freelance writing as well, in addition yeah. to my books. But sort of with anything in this acting world, and as much as I consider myself a salesperson, visibility and discoverability can yeah. be very challenging. Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes hard to know which area to focus on when you are sort of a multi hyphenate, uh, which efforts will yield the most results. So, but some of my freelance writing gigs for now have dried up. I'm hoping they'll return um, maybe even shortly because that does help a little bit. Yeah, uh, let's let's get to your writing because uh, again, I'm I'm a big fan. <laughs> Um, I love I love writing, uh, and uh, so do you. You've written uh, you know novels, romance novels, uh, kind of historical uh, novels. You've written uh, the two books that you've uh, shared with us uh, that deal with your you know life uh, in the acting world. Um, what drives your desire uh, to write? I first discovered romance novels in junior high, and I started devouring them as many romance readers do. And then as I got older. Again, pre-internet, I thought I'm going to try to write a book. And so I started writing it by hand. I had about 60 pages. And then yeah. I finally got one of those typewriters that had like a tiny word processor screen. And so yeah. that made it easier to do some editing instead of literally cutting and pasting. But even though I had gone to the library and tried to research it, it was more when the internet came and email and online things that I was able to learn more about the romance writing community 
I became active in Romance Writers of America, served on the board of directors for three years, and wow. started learning more about the craft and the business. Because just like acting, it really is a business. Yeah. If you want to, I mean, anyone can write in theory, but if you want to sell and have your books published, it's a business. It's true. And um, uh, did you, I think you self-published or did you publish anything uh, through a publisher uh, as well? Well, I have, right now I have three novellas with a small press. My mm -hmm. initial dream was to have a traditional publishing and I submitted many times. I had three agents, including one from William Morris. And it, yeah. And I was just never able to get what they call the call. So mm -hmm. Eventually, when I saw that some of my colleagues and friends were self-publishing and doing well with that route, I thought uh, the time had come. My first book had won a national contest at the time, and mm -hmm. I had geared it toward a specific line of a specific publisher. And because this contest at the time had such a big reputation, they requested it right away. And then a year later, they sent what's called a revision letter, which means they like it a lot, but not enough to give you a contract. So I made what I thought was all the changes that they wanted. And then a year later, they sent me another revision letter. So I tried to make all those changes, and then they said no. So I decided at that time, after all the rejections and close but no cigars, another novel also came in second in another contest where the winner got a publishing contract. <laughs> so I know. So I feel like a lot of close but no cigars, and so I finally decided to self-publish, and then that yep. became these three books my um, historical romance novels set in medieval England. Isn't it cute? Yeah, it is. Um, we'll link them below as well so everybody can uh, connect. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, it's, I, I find it, uh, it's not humorous at all. Uh, and it's, it's kind of uh, sad that it takes so long. You know, it, it takes years for you to get a couple of letters and you're you have to live your life and uh it, it being in that environment and uh you know trying to figure out whether anything is going to take off is just a a really uh disturbing uh, process i'm glad you self-published um uh, i chose that route as well after having an, a bad experience with publishing um, yes but i still wanted as i said with the vetting of being an actor for pieces for my reel i still wanted the vetting of a real publisher on the spine. And even though I know a lot of my friends, especially now, are responsible for their own promotion, and unless they're at a very high level, the publisher doesn't do a lot of that. I still wanted traditional publishing. So, And even just yesterday, I got a rejection for something new I was trying, so. Okay, well. Still goes well, on. It's it's par for the course. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, the, the other reality check, and here's my reality check, right? So. Uh -oh. you know, I, I'm a poet and I've been writing poetry since I was like, mm. seven years old. So um, I, you know, I took a uh, hundred of my uh, poems and I, and I published it uh, first through uh, Belboa uh, Press um, because they said that, hey, we're going to get your books uh, in the stores and it's going to go great and, uh, you know, pay us this much money. And then I saw that it was not happening and there were a lot of well, we didn't actually say that type of thing. So I said, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> and I, I decided to do self-publish. And when I came out with my kind of, uh, you know, self-help uh, uh, book, uh, I self-published. Um, the reality check is, you know, if people think that, you know, we're looking at J.K. Rowling and uh, she's, you know, a multimillionaire and uh, all you have to do is just write something and people are going to gobble it up. Uh, maybe, yeah. but no. for, for me, uh, uh, maybe I got, you know, a couple hundred people that, uh, that read the book. So, uh, I get, uh, I get checks at the end of the year that my accountant laughs at, uh, it's like, you know, 27 cents or whatever is my, you know, is my residual. Um, what has been your reality check experience in, in writing books? Well, some of that too, romance writers, readers are very avid. They'll read a lot of books a month, but it's visibility and getting the word out. And when I did release my first book, I had some more famous authors tweeting for me and sharing for me. And I did get some uh, press in some sort of national romancy type things, but I just didn't um, get the traction I was hoping for. And then I did something that a lot of people advise against, which was changing genres to write my contemporary books. Because while a lot of authors can do that, 
especially for self-published now, what my understanding is you should have a lot of books out in the same genre. And I chose to write four medieval romances and then switch to contemporary. And the, the fourth medieval romance was starting a new series. And I probably should have written three of those books and then put them all out at once. But I haven't even finished the second one yet. So, and I did all the things that you're supposed to do. I tried to grow my email newsletter. I tried doing promotions. There yeah. is a book marketing thing. I don't know if you're able to get one or willing to try it. Have you heard of BookBub, B-U-B? Uh, I heard of it. I did not use it. Okay. And I don't know if it would work for your genres, but for romance, it's still one of the most hard to get into and then then produces the best results of any book promotion. So I my first three books I put into a boxed set and I was able to get a book bub to sell those three books for just 99 cents. And that went so well that the boxed set became the number one historical romance in America, US and Canada, just from that one promotion. Okay. It cost 600, 700, $800. But mm -hmm. I earned that out, of course. The, the trouble is sustaining that and constant promotion and the learning curve for Amazon ads and Facebook ads and maintaining yeah. all of that, which I just have not done. Because everything takes time. And uh, I was talking to and money. Uh, and money, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I still get calls all the time of, hey, you know, your book uh, and the Inspire book, which has been out since 2012. Uh, your book is amazing and people love it and, uh, you know, pay us $1,500 to promote it in, in Germany at the book fair. I'm like, yep, I get it too. Yeah. Well, every author, I'm sure, you know, yeah, yeah. they're trying. Um, uh, I was talking to, uh, you know, uh, one of, uh, one of the books I really like is by Don Miguel Ruiz and it's the four agreements. Again, it's in the self-help mm -hmm. kind of uh, space. And I was talking to his uh, son who said, listen, you know, when, when we started out, we were just going to libraries, we were going to meetups, we were going and speaking in front of two, three sure. people, and you get started. And as you kind of uh, continue developing that, that's when things start picking up. But all of that takes, you know, aside from writing something that's actually uh, good, it takes a long time. It takes a long um, time. Yeah, and uh, as you know, you're doing uh, acting, you're doing uh, a lot of other things. I don't know if we have enough time to kind of dedicate to, <laughs> you know, knock on that door. So, yeah, constant promotion or finding a great virtual assistant who you do have to pay something to and hope yeah. that your return is enough to to hire someone to help you. Yeah, which I have not done. So, but do you find that you're uh, <clears throat> because you're a writer and because you're uh, and we're going to get to you being a uh, panster uh, in a second, which I am as well. <laughs> um, uh, do you find that it actually helps um, color your acting because you are a storyteller? So when you're in front of the camera, it helps you come up with more more stuff uh, on the on the spot or develop a character better just because you're in that mode of uh, writing. I think that's a great question, but I think it's more the opposite. I oh. think being an actor has helped my writing because of improv and because of how stories develop visually. I feel it helps me write scenes because I can see them mm -hmm. better. I'll have to think next time I do an on-camera job. I don't know how much it would help with the commercial. It might, but more in a film, I think. I'm going to try to think about that and I'll get back to you. But usually when I'm on set, I haven't even connected the two. So gotcha. I'll, I'll try that next time. Yeah, um, the the idea just came to me as I was asking you that question. So I have not tried it myself uh, either. Yeah, well, uh, let's do that and, and and circle back. Sounds good. In the in the second uh, you know uh, version of this uh, of this interview, uh, we'll discuss uh, our findings. Where are they now? Yeah, I I did find uh, what you uh, what you did mention that acting influences your writing. Um, I remember being at uh, at Black Box uh, acting, taking their B1 class, and uh, because you kind of have to, you know, create a lot of the uh, a, um, a lot of these scenarios uh, on your own. And in you know some scenarios, I had to create on the spot. They give you a few minutes, and you have to come up with this. And it just started flowing so much. I said, Oh my God, I haven't thought about writing a novel. I have enough to write a novel now. Of course, I go. didn't write. There you go. I didn't write well, it down. I forgot it. So. One page a day, one yeah. page a day, and then you'll have a book. Yeah. That's all it um, takes. 
Yeah, and you kind of have to do it, right? You you uh, you didn't finish your book. You started writing your book, and you didn't finish it until a long time after. Uh, right. I have seven books that I have started, and uh, only a few yeah. I finish because you just have to get it done. Yeah, and I do have some I've started as well, but <laughs> maybe I'll go back to them. We'll see. We'll see. I still like them, but and I also have a couple that I have not yet published because they're again in different genres. Um, so. Yep, uh, we we all. But have it, to and it takes, as you know, time and effort just to get even a self-published book done. You know, you have to get an. I got editors, um, layout, cover designer, all that kind of stuff. So. And you have it's to have, lot. and you have to have, uh, you know, all sorts of things. And uh, exactly. You know, exactly. You know, my I I had to have my wife, uh, who you know, this has a lot to do with my life, and my <laughs> wife is mentioned in it. So my my. You know, executive editor was my wife, making sure that I only include things that uh, are relevant yeah. and <laughs> are not putting anybody at harm's way. Well, my family, I can say they did not get to read these before they came out. So um, I don't know, honestly, if they've even read them after, but I haven't received any complaints for how I transformed. And only they know what is sort of based on reality and what is added for the book. Sure. Well, listen, you're, you're a writer. You take creative license. So that's, that's <laughs> yeah. beauty. Uh, wonderful. Um, as as we wrap up, I wanted to ask you that, you know, you've you've had a very wide uh, kind of experience in all sorts of things within acting, writing. You've had a normal uh, kind of uh, job and career. So if you had a chance to talk to a young version of yourself, um, and you had one advice that you can give. What would that advice be? Hmm, good question. To my, to myself or a young person wanting to be an actor? Let's make those two separate questions. But the first okay. one. Is, okay. Yeah. To myself, mm -hmm. I guess I would have to say believe in yourself sooner. Okay. That would be it for sure. Because. When people are telling you, I was also teased a lot as a kid and bullied. And so when everyone around you is telling you how ugly you are or how weird you are and things like that, and then, you know, people, I don't think people should support people falsely either. But when, when the feedback that you're getting is not good, it's hard to sort of push past that and still believe this is what I want to really do and I can be good at it. So uh, I would say to my younger self, believe in yourself and trust yourself sooner. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, <but no. laughs> I, that, that's true. Because there's a couple decisions that I made out of fear mm -hmm. of not succeeding if I took this job, for example, or if I stayed uh, here and didn't come back home, things like that, that, I, that were just out of fear because I was afraid I couldn't support myself. So back in the day, long time ago. So. Right. So trust yourself and, and, and believe. Good. Uh, oh, and, and then to the young actor, I would say one thing I did do, which I think was really good, like I said, was start preparing right now. There's, If you want to be an actor, there's something you can do today to take a step toward that career, especially with the Internet. There's free courses. There's free everything. Uh, again, sort the wheat from the chaff. But the sooner you start preparing and learning the craft and the business, and developing the skills and materials that you need to have an agent to get auditions, the better off you'll be. Because it's really hard to wake up, let's say, in your middle years with no experience. It's it's hard enough when you have some training and some background and jobs. Um, I'd also worked at a couple of radio stations, so I had a little background in that. But when you if you have no experience in the industry, it could be really hard just to wake up one day and be like, I'm going to be an actor. Um, that's sad, and this it's a great advice, but that's sad when you're starting out in your middle years, you know, like uh, I did, uh, like you did. Um, I found that I actually have, you know, uh, a wider avenue, and, uh, you know, because I'm older, uh, people, uh, there are less of me, uh, and I would, uh, I would think that there are less, uh, less people within a certain age group and look uh, that you have to compete against. So I think it's that's true. Awesome. Yeah. But it's also my experience. And if you watch just general TV shows that women of a certain age hmm. 
think how many older women you see, it's a little better in a couple recent years, but how many women, let's just say over 50, are in positions of power, are doctors. There's one on New Amsterdam I can think of. How many gray-haired people are in positions of power? Their patients, it just seems to be what I watch anyway, their patients, their grandparents, you know, um, but they're, they don't carry their own show unless they're already celebrities like Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin, you know, can do uh, their show, Grace and Frankie. So mm -hmm. I find that the opportunities are more for younger people, even though there are more of them to compete as well. So there is that. That's a fair point. And uh, again, me being a man, I think there's probably more. Yeah. Uh, more I would more. agree. Yeah, even though. Agree. You know, as as the industry is changing, and I'm a white, uh, yes. you know, I'm a white dude. Uh, so <laughs> I have now I have less roles as well because there's more diversity. Thank God that's coming to our uh, to our industry. So it's it's a yes. it's an interesting, weird uh, kind of world that yes. we live in. Um, yes. All right, as as we as we wrap up, and uh, not to put you on the spot, but I really wanted to do this. Uh -oh. um, why okay. why don't you uh, kind of uh, read us out and say goodbye to everybody and uh, tell people to share and subscribe because I know you're a speed talker. So I'd love to see if you can do it. <laughs> okay, three, two, one. Thank you so much for watching The Love of Acting with host Ellen Baysberg and guest today, Ruth Kaufman, and where I got to discuss my acting in my books. And please watch and subscribe and share and tell all your friends about it. And if you're interested, please at least look at my books on Amazon and see if you want to read them. And my reels and everything are at my website, which is www.ruthcox.com. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.